sweet. So now we are live again. So this is the first one that I think Steve wants to review. So can you give us a quick overview of what, it, what this is? Okay, yeah, yeah, Levi is probably actually the best contact for the implementation and um, overall shape of this API. But basically when we're implementing custom encoders, um, there's like two code paths, one, one for UTF-8 and one for UTF-16. And um, I did the UTF-8 one um, um, last week, and then I got to the UTF-16 side, and I found that the API that I was using when I was um, writing the code to support UTF-8 did not exist for UTF-16 um, for encoding. And uh, there's, a, there's an encode for UTF-16, but it takes a string and returns a string, and we can't um call that efficiently because we just have a span of car and we don't want to do any copies of bytes or you know any kind of lx so um when i was talking to levi yesterday he just suggested that we create an issue for this and i which i did and i copied the um syntax from code utf8 and instead of byte is car um I don't know if this is going to be overkill for some of the scenarios in the sense of like this return code, for example. Um, the the uh, UTF-16 version does not have a error code, it just returns a string. But but I'll, I'll let Levi comment on, on yeah. whether this is the proper so I, I, I think, I mean, Steve actually gave a really good overview of it. So there, there are today um, encode methods which take as input string, returns a string, takes as input a char array, writes it to a text reader, and so on. Um, but there are no methods that take a read-only span of char. And as Steve alluded to, um, that's difficult for the JSON stack to consume because the JSON stack is working with read-only span of char everywhere. Uh, so this is adding read-only span of char overloads to the encode method. Mm -hmm. the because it's using spans, um, the signature is using an operation status uh, pattern and it's simply mirroring the operation status pattern that already exists for the UTF-8 overload that's already checked in. But yeah, change byte to char and remove UTF-8 from the parameter names. Yeah, so the, so the second one makes sense. Uh, so the first one is not actually proposed then? The first one's already there. And the second, it, it's just showing that we're proposing the same pattern, just with different types. So char instead of byte. If you pull up APIs of .NET, you can see what the existing encode APIs. Yeah, are. I'm trying to look at this because on text encoder there is no encode UTF-8. That's why I'm asking. Uh, encode UTF-8 was checked in. Um, maybe APIs of .NET is out of date. You know, do you not refresh it every day at like two in the morning? I do. It's definitely it's, there. It's updated since 7.16. Yep, it's in sports.net. Yeah. Encode UTF-8 and encode UTF-8 shim. The other one's internal. Both yeah. are internal. Both are internal. Uh, then source.net might be out of date. <laughs> uh, source.net is literally on head. <laughs> Did you guys make it public? I didn't check it <laughs> I mean... Yeah, checked in 25 days ago by you. You checked it in as internal. Uh, it should have been. Oh, Sorry, he, one sec. he did it yesterday. Oh, it, it's not one yet. It, it, okay. it, it was changed recently to be public just to support um, encode. Yeah, it looks like you did it yesterday. Okay, yes, and that's what it was. Yes, um, it, was it was done a couple weeks ago or a week ago. Um, well, the API maybe, but not the way, not the part of it's public. No, so yeah, so the part where it's public is checked into uh, is checked into core effects. It got checked in like you said yesterday. So, it source.net and APIs of .net just aren't. Just okay. that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, like if it's yeah, if it was checking yeah. yesterday, we might have yeah. not picked up the build yet. Um, yeah. So the second one, I mean, looking at the signature makes sense. Uh, first one is a bit odd because we have nothing else that is suffix with anything right now, but I guess that's the way it is. Uh, there are two UTF-8 methods on text encoder that got checked in the other day. 
Yeah, I mean, when I'm looking at it right now, it, it, it it's not. Right? This is basically like it's of yesterday or of today, depending on the yeah. point. It's it's the first time we have one six suffixes, but I mean that's kind of the way we have it anyway. In the kind of way, so seems reasonable. And then yeah, the when we brought this a while back through API review, uh, it was either this or spin up an entirely new UTF-8 encoder class, yeah. which we thought was the worst option. No, I know. Like it, it, it's yeah, it's not a problem. It's just you look at it and it's like yeah. It's a problem. I mean. What else would it be called that? And so then I guess we said we call it source destination bytes consumed, bytes written, and its final block. Yeah. Basically just remove the UTF eight from the parameter names. Yep. Um Yeah, that works for me. And the I don't know, I'm still not hundred percent certain on the span APIs. Is this the pattern we usually have? Bytes consumed, then bytes written? Yes. And then its final block last. I mean, feel free to propose another pattern. But no, I'm just asking. I mean, honestly, I, I, <laughs> I, I've not looked at span APIs. The, so the, the reason, it, it's not span APIs that have that pattern, it's operation status APIs. Yeah, that that's that right. Pattern. That's what I mean. Because you're, yeah. with operation status, you're working with potentially not the entire set of input data. Yep. So the, the out parameters and the return value need to tell you how much progress was made. Yep. so that you can appropriately slice or concat on the next call. If we had APIs that just operated with string, um, as the existing overloads do, like you don't have to worry about any of that. It's just, oh, string in, string out, done. Makes sense. But you are taking the hit of the allocations there, which is intentional. A64 and code to UTF-8 is named poorly, but the source destination then Bytes consumed, which is, of course, and bytes written, which is your final block, which is default true. And that's an operation status API, right? Yeah. I think we haven't been, we haven't been very consistent with the parameter naming here. Um, consumed and written, or bytes consumed and bytes written. Okay. At least we got that. Started standardizing on destination is the name of the thing that's writing and sources of feeding. Yeah. Work in progress bullets. And memory and operation All Right. So then, what do you ask anything else? And this is what it is. Uh, did, and this is going to this be get modified while it was on the screen? Yes. Uh, I, I didn't modify it, I, I just updated did. the text. You modi oh. What did you modify? You modified um, the I, UTF-8 parameter names. I didn't. I did. Came out dead. So keep in mind that is an existing checked-in API. Are you suggesting that we modify that on the existing checked-in API as well? Uh, we should. Okay. I thought we had previously said that for the ones that are read-only span of byte, we wanted to be explicit that they were UTF-8 inputs. Well, that's what I asked earlier. Like the, um, basically, when you look at this stuff here, so we're, we're, when I asked whether we should remove UTF-8 from the parameter names, everybody seems to nod. That's why I added that out. I don't remember you even asking the question. Yeah, I don't remember that question either. <laughs> yeah, I, I missed that question, Emo. <laughs> did you actually ask it, Emo? I did. <laughs> I can did you, did you it ask up. it? Did you ask it in YouTube chat where no one can answer? No, I asked it loud, and I think uh, at least Viva responded to that. So I thought you asked, you know, are we being consistent? I was looking at parameter ordering because somebody said remove the UTF-8 suffix, and I mean, and, and I asked from the parameters, and then the answer was yes. Oh, I did that on the encode method. Oh, the UTF-16 one. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah, because I had thought we had previously said. Any APIs where yeah. we expose read only span of byte, we yeah. wanted to be explicit in the name that it was a UTF-8 yeah. input. When we meant read only span of chart. Mm. Yeah. Alright, so then the method name is encode, then source is UTF-8 source, destination is UTF-8 destination. Go, go back to the previous head. Well, destination would just be destination because this is an encoding operation. So. Oh wait, no, because we're doing characters to characters. So yes, it would be destination. So like this thing. 
No. That thing the code UTF-8. Of, the name of the method as in the public ref as of last night is it's code right. UTF-8. Yeah. I just asked, should we remove the UTF-8 suffix from the method? No, so go, yes. I, I made an edit this morning at around like 9.50 a.m. That edit was, as far as I can tell, correct per everyone's naming guidelines. How do I do that? Oh, great. I can't actually go back to the other edit. I mean, like, this is going to be... We have a bunch of warts because we really should have added Char-8. Yeah. We really, 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 really wish we had added Char-8. Yeah. All right. There are enough videos on the internet. <laughs> All right, so they can go back. So one more time. What's the method name? Encode UT the first one's encode UTF-8. Okay. You can also just copy it from what's checked in if you need to. Um, yeah, this might be more work than just doing it this way. So then, is this the one we want? Uh, the yes, correct. Correct. And then the second one is just encode source destination. Yes, because the user chars. Fine. All right. Anything else? Oh, it's, this is what it is. All right. So then, next one. Post this one here. Put my cursor again. Right there we go. So this, it turns out, we might not actually need for three O. Um, but just on the off chance we do need it, it would be good to just get a through review since it's here. Um, there might be cases, and we're not aware of any, um, where developers uh, really, really hate some of the ways that we encode things like double quotes um, inside the uh, encoding routines. Uh, the default encoder is very opinionated in the sense that it's trying to prevent common misuses and it will do things like it will escape a double quote character using slash u syntax instead of just slash double quote. And the reason for this is if you happen to call this inside of an HTML attribute or inside of a script block, we don't want malicious input to be able to escape that and then XSS your website. Um, so, for developers who really find that particular encoding unpalatable <clears throat> and who really, honest to God, just want like slash double quote, uh, we can provide a factory method that creates an encoder that produces that relaxed output. Um, now, to clarify, based on what I said earlier, like we we thought that uh, that we were seeing feedback from developers regarding this in the 3.0 timeframe, but it turns out uh, we weren't. We were accidentally conflating it with another issue. So, it this might not be necessary for 3.0. Um, uh, so let me add. Oh, great, awesome. Let software. me add some context. Perfect. Yeah, let me add some context to help motivate, because just because I talked to Nick a bit more, mm -hmm. and it turns out. In core setup, and the X, there's an X unit issue where over escaping the plus and the forward slash causes .NET test to fail. And I had thought that the plus was coming from basically for encoded text only, mm -hmm. which I would have thought we could fix separately. But turns out the SHA 512 that you end up writing in the assets file is actually a regular string that has a basically for component, and the whole string is not basically for encoded. Okay. So we would end up actually needing this to unblock .NET test from working for 3.0. So core core setup would call this, or yeah, what, what's the dep dependency, dependency model? Okay. Uh, dependency model uses this to generate the depth JSON file and the assets file. Yeah. So there there is a bug in the JSON unescaping routine that's currently used by core setup, and the fact that we're escaping uh, the plus character is exposing that bug. So this API would allow core setup and others to work around it. All 
Uh, <clears throat> there is another workaround, Levi, that, that we discussed briefly. It's very ugly, but you can oh. derive from JavaScript encoder mm -hmm. and um, override some method to say allow um, plus, whatever you want. Yes. It's not supported, but it is another option, I guess, yeah. for emergency use only. Yeah, it's it's not something I would really want to put into a shipping product, though. Like, it is the definition of a hack workaround. Yeah, we can't really stop people from doing it. Right. But, but I mean, but we can, by, we don't want to promote its usage by including it inside of our source code, though, as something that people can look at and maybe think is best practice. Yeah, it sounds to me like then we don't need the API at all. It's somewhat off of this No, so so we do, um, because it's core setup and others would need to call into this. Well, didn't you just say there's a record one of the there, there's a base sixty four thing or whatever it was? There is. It's no, so sorry, so I, I thought that the data that was being outputted was base sixty four encoded purely. Yeah. And uh, I skipped escaping the plus in base sixty four. But that doesn't fix it because they're actually writing strings, not base sixty four. I see. And so, what is the? I still don't understand what the problem is. So, like, I mean, it's it's escaped and unescaped when you read it back, right? So the the no, that's the problem. The particular unescape routine that they're using had a bug that couldn't read this, even though it was well formed JSON. Yeah, so it would actually like index out of range or something yeah. if you had uh, escaped. Uh, uh, like plus that was a skip in your yeah. JSON payload. So and you can, and it's a bug yeah. unit. So you you can escape a plus, for instance, as slash u zero zero whatever. Right. Right. But and and the JSON specification says this is totally valid. Every right. compliant JSON parser has to understand this. However, the particular JSON parser that was being run over this uh, had a bug where it couldn't understand this, and it was causing failures. And in order to work around that. Um, amongst other things, like this API would help with that by saying, hey, don't escape things like plus. Like, just let them go as is. That way you're less likely to ex to encounter that bug in practice. That bug is not in our stack. The, the reading bug is not in our yeah. stack. Otherwise, we would just fix it. There are other workarounds. For instance, uh, you could do a string uh, replace. Um, like you could replace slash, you could you could use a fancy regex pattern because it would it would have to be that, uh, and then replace slash u blah 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 with plus, assuming there's an even number of slashes in front of it. But yeah, it gets hairy. Do we think that a whole enum is necessary for that? Uh, I'm open to ideas. Because I mean, if if we think there will be multiple behaviors, then we should probably make it flag so that if we x, if because I think there will probably be independent options. Not oh yeah, that should have been flags. Sorry, but then even then, like it seems a bit odd that default, which is zero, would be the way we use for whatever it is. Zero would be the thing we already hit. It. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Except that I think for most enums, it seems odd. Default like for, being zero is. I mean, for flag based enums, it seems weird that zero means, well, it's a particular combination of flags, but it's not the one I'm telling you. Like, like flags usually have the default, not default, but being none. Right? Like, it basically means no bit set. Yeah, so these. In which case, it would yeah. mean, well, it's not. It's zero, but it's not none. It's, well, whatever the behavior is. Think, <laughs> think of this almost like. Um, each one of these flags represents a different protection that's being disabled by the default encoder. By having the default value of zero, that means every protection is enabled by default. Uh, and then you're opting out of individual protections on a flag by flag basis. Yeah, which would basically be logically all ones, right? So you're, in your suggestion, the enum is which protections to turn on. And this is which protections to turn off. Oh, because you have a negated logic, I see. Yes. Because I, by default, they're all on. I don't think it's unusual to have an enum where the default may be enabled for some feature. No, that's not odd. What's odd is that you have an API where 
So basically, so we don't have flags even to my to my knowledge where the zero value is not named none. So we can name it none. I think it's a guideline. Well, but then you would say your escaping behavior is none, which sounds like nothing's escaped. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, like, and then we could call it escaping why, exceptions. Why? But uh, why, why would we want this to be a flags? Yeah, well, what's the next thing you're gonna add? Uh, the next thing, the next thing to add, for instance, would be: um, uh, Do you want us to disable best fit mapping replacements by default? Stuff like that. So, if you pass in a smart quote, for instance, could we escape it even if smart quotes otherwise allowed by the encoder? Right, but if I say just that and don't say relax, is so again pretend it's flags. Does that make yeah. sense independent of the relaxed one? Because our current default, we're already we're already doing it. So that's really only a modifier on relax, which means that we're not flags, we're modes. Like we're, this is entirely, you have to name everything of what it does. And maybe we'll end up with some ugly combinatoric names over the next 50 years, but yeah. not all of, not all combinations would be valid, which means yeah. it's not a good candidate for flags. I mean, honestly, like, I mean, we can just honestly just make them overloads with rules. I mean, it's not great, but at the same time, it's also not horrible. Another thing that you could do, um, is you could have instead of having an enum you could have a static property which says give me an encoder which has all of this relaxed behavior just automatically set on it how do you support property. kinetics for that yeah. Yeah. static property a uh, static property on javascript encoder uh, we uh, have a global that modifies other libraries so no 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 no, no. so no a, a static a static property that returns an instance of the encoder it's a static property factory so there, there's already a static property JavaScript encoder dot default, which returns an instance of the encoder, which has been instantiated with all default settings. Yeah, that's what I thought you yeah. said, but the problem is you can't support combinations for that, right? Because basically, you would have to provide we would static properties we for would, all combinations. We would say here which is JSON the client. behavior forever of yeah. the relaxed JSON escaping yeah. encoder, which honestly, if you consider it a mode of operation, would be totally fine. I mean, one other option is you just make an overloads of create, right? So we add one overload right now that has, I don't know, relaxed escaping equals false as a default. And then if we ever have to add one more, we add another overload before the other one and we move the default on this one. And then that's the way you configure it. So to you know, speak from a security thing, uh, if it's Boolean overloads, we can't ever find them. So we can't audit them, we can't assess yeah. them. Uh, we can't write a tool that says this needs to be flat. Like you yeah. need to pay double attention to this. If it's a named, if it's a named alternative to create, mm -hmm. like create relaxed escaping of text encoder settings, uh, or if it's the uh, accelerated instance, then then those you can yeah. you can write tools to identify that you're using one of these and it needs the extra. Speed. So I I do actually discuss that to an extent later in this issue. Um, if like whatever we name this thing. We actually have to have a similar rule for internal use that flags it and warns, because it's not going to be SDL approved on its own. I actually prefer the named enum that we have right now as proposed because it's more scalable. The bool option, if you have two of bools, now you get confusion of like which up parameter yeah. means what. Well, so it kind I mean, of hurts that's you what I'm saying. Report. To me, that argument will hold water if I can actually extend that enum in the same way. And I'm saying I don't think that's true right now. So I think we can if it's modes, right? Like if they're mutually exclusive modes, like default is uh, one mode and then relax is keeping another. And then when we extend it to another one, it will be a completely separate mode. Yeah, to be, to be perfectly honest, like I don't really see relaxed being further modified because it's already relaxed. Like to be absolutely perfectly honest. Sure, but then I think in that case I would suggest a completely different enum, right? Which is fine. Um, one of the other things I called out in this issue is I want a name that properly conveys your turning off protections. Make sure this is really what you intended. So why not have it be a struct of options? A struct of options is otherwise known as an enum. Right, but I mean, it's more extensible in that way. You can still have the bools. You can differentiate them. You can have the yeah. logic that says that these combinations are allowed and these other ones aren't. I mean, we that would also work. I'm not necessarily married to this design. Yeah, I mean, 
Which point, I mean, another thing I was looking at earlier is why is this not modifying text encoder settings? Uh, because it's not, text encoder settings is used by HTML, URL, JavaScript, and a few other things. Um, this okay. is not honored by any of them. That makes sense. That's also why it has relaxed JSON escaping in the name. Like JavaScript. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so if you wanted complete control over this, um, which I don't think we do, you could, because you, you already have a way to specify the allow list, right? Um, which well, is all we kind of, you kind of. The, but then we yeah. we overlay the forbidden characters on top of that, yes. which includes things like the plus sign. And there's no way you can see what that forbidden list is or modify it. If well, there was a way to no. do that, which I don't think Levi would like, no. um, at least some of the characters like quote. But if there was, then you could do whatever you wanted. Yeah, so you can always see the forbidden list because our source code's public. Um, modification is, I, I don't think that's a path we want to go down. Yeah, what do people think then about this alternative? Basically, it's a bunch of bools you, you can set. The default is none, which means you can whatever, whatever the default behavior Shouldn't is. Shouldn't this be a struct then, not an enum? Well, I, you know. if it's a flag enum, then what's the benefit of making this run? Okay, so encoding options none means just opt me into whatever the default thing is. Are we ever going to have more than 32? No. I, I no. hope not. Yeah, I mean, like, but you know, my my question of the only other option that you have thought of ahead of time is the uh, best fit mapping, and what does it mean if you say best fit mapping and not flax? Like, is that effectively the same as none? At which point, this is not a good flax. I mean, that is also true. Although we do have flags where not all combinations are meaningful. Mm -hmm. right? So, well, so Emo, I, I actually don't understand why do you want to opt it for flags? Why make it flags? What's the general guidance like making enums flags versus regular? Well, if you, so, the, the the current proposal is that these are independent choices, right? Yeah. Well, that, that, yes. that's that's your argument of being scalable, right? If it's not independent options, then it's not scalable. Because now that means if we if we add another option, we basically know every enum value has to somehow represent a combination of other enum members which doesn't fly when you have more than two or three, right? I, mean, I, thought, I thought regular enums are what make independent like modes. Yeah, but, but, can that, be but, the, but that's basically the equivalent of saying, we don't have an enum, we just have different method names, which means you can only ever modify one thing. You cannot say, I want this option and this other option. But th that's basically the thing that, that enums buy you with a flex combination. You can say, well, I want the relaxed encoding and I want this other thing that I want to tweak, right? Yeah. I, I'm having, aside from that one about best fit mapping, like I'm having a lot of trouble thinking of what other value would ever be added to the CNM, to be perfectly honest. Which to me sounds more like, at that point, it's an overload with a different name. Or just the uh, different accelerator statics, like we have default. And yeah, that also works. Relax Jason escaping can yeah. we add. Yep. Uh, then the, the, I mean, the only thing about is can you get the relax Jason escaping with the custom map? Does that make sense? So right now you can do that because of the way that the overload is created. Um, if we had a, if we had a static <laughs> property, uh, it would probably be instantiated with um, the entire BMP range. So including uh, Chinese, Japanese, Cyrillic, and so on. Right. So, I mean, but my question is, would you, does it ever make sense to say that you want relaxed and a custom range? If no, then it should just be a, a, an accelerated instance. I, I don't know why anyone would do that. I mean, you, you could. I just don't know why anyone would in practice. So I think I'm in favor of doing an accelerated instance, and if we get more demands later that require more complicated input mod modes, then we can come up with the thing. But that we should drop this struct, we should drop that overload create, and we should just have one instance that behaves differently yep. than the rest. And uh, and that like that's an internal implementation detail of how it gets there. Okay. Yeah, that's really my point. Like That's what I'm saying. To me, scalable only makes sense if we design the enum to be scalable. Otherwise, so we, might if, as well. if we need to reconsider this in the future, then we can add the enum at that time once we figure out what the appropriate once, might yes, be. Yes, once we have a third 
workforce okay. thing so we can understand what the modeling is, what the combinatorics look like, does sure. it make sense with the text decoder settings? That's, that's then fair. we understand are the alternatives to create, is it a mode, is it a struct, is it a flag, is it a thing? Sure. I think right now we, we just don't know enough about how this would grow. Okay. And if we don't think it really would grow, then we just need the one instance. And, and the static is nice, um, it's easier to use, and people don't have to worry about caching it. I think, you know, can reuse it across different yeah. areas of code. Does this? One question I have is how would that compose with custom uh, escape uh, encoders that are created by the create method? Because if I want to not escape Chinese characters, but I also want to relax just escaping, how would the static property work? I mean, that, that's what uh, that's what we were just talking about with Jeremy. Um, it's the, the relaxed one allows not ASCII by default. Well, it allows not ASCII uh, period, not by default, just period. So it would be. Uh, equivalent to default uh, JavaScript encoder create Unicode ranges dot all comma relax just in escaping. Yes. Gotcha. And if, if we want something in the middle for that later, then somebody can propose it and we can figure out what to model it as. But but this is the yeah. Effectively, this is is this actually minimal or is it minimal plus like it's not it's not minimal. Two other things. It's not minimal. It's there, it is still somewhat opinionated because it will still escape things that the JSON spec says don't have to be escaped. Um, for instance, C1 control characters, uh, non-printable white space, and so on. Emoji. So I, I think I, I like this proposal. I had one question for the original proposal. Yes. Yeah. Why did you choose to only include this enum <clears throat> on the create method that took text encoder and not the other one? Uh, because the text encoder settings is itself instantiable from a set of Unicode ranges, so it was the more uh, uh, it was the more generic one. Okay, more generalized. Right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So you you were asking Unicode ranges dot all like why doesn't it allow those things? If no, I said dot all, you said you're escaping emoji. Yeah, but you also said all Unicode characters. Yes, uh, <laughs> other than C1 controls and, and and a few and a few other things. Like I said, this this is opinionated. Um, so the, the reason for that is the settings class passed into it can't represent anything over 64K because that's as high as the bitmap goes. So anything beyond that, including emoji, it just says, screw it, I'm going to encode it. Um, they shouldn't be common enough where anyone should really care about it. Uh, all of the characters in common use throughout the world uh, fit very cleanly into the basic multilingual plane, which the bitmap can cleanly represent. That CJK was outside of the view. Nope, it's inside. There are um, there are some very very rare one off characters that are outside that they're not in common use. So what is the instance scenario if I really need custom ranges and the redex encoding? What would I do? You would file you, a first off for any way. Yeah. yeah. First off, you <laughs> you don't have that scenario. If you think you have that scenario, I invite you to explain why you think you have it. <laughs> Well, I mean, the question is more like, I mean, today you you also cannot just extend JavaScript encoder, right, with, and, and use custom ranges, right? You would have to literally write everything yourself at that point. Yeah, you, you have to override it and subclass all the abstract methods, or override yeah. all the abstract methods, which, by the way, our editor browser will never, so good luck finding them. Right. Yeah, I'm just asking for that, because it always seems odd if we make things not independent choices just yeah. because we think the probability is low, because at some point somebody may hit this, and then it may make codes badly for yeah. me. But I, yeah, if if the whole current design already has that, then I don't care. So, so this is what people are are circling around. Does this name, does this name properly suggest you really don't want to call this unless you know what you're doing? No. I mean, I have it's to be honest. To me, the scenario seems somewhat busted because. It's like saying, well, somebody cannot add two numbers, so we give you a different overload of subtract that has an overload that says bogus behavior for compat. Yeah. And that kind of seems like it's the same way. Like, I mean, we, we, we have a correct JSON parser and reader. Yeah. Sorry, parser and generator, writer, I guess. And uh, somebody else can't read it. And so it seems a bit weird to have an overload that says, make the stuff work with the other thing. Which is that by definition an open-ended set of like people can have arbitrary bugs in the JSON yeah, yeah. parser. It's uh, it's not it's not arbitrary bugs in the JSON parser that it's trying to defend against. The the default all of the default encoders, not just the JavaScript one, HTML, URL, everything else, um, protect against 
known viable attacks for which proof of concepts or proofs of concept exist. Right. Um, like right, the, only aggressively. The, yeah. So the reason that the JavaScript encoder encodes plus by default is because there is an actual, honest to god, legitimate attack that you can pull against websites. Yeah, if you know, plus I, is not no, I, I get why we are doing it. Yeah. All I'm saying is that if you write a JSON parser, right, yeah. and you can't handle escaping, I mean, that's a fundamental bug in your parser, right? Yes. So that means if we we emit a plus that is backslash u whatever, right, mm -hmm. and then somebody else can't read that. It seems a bit odd that we create an overload that says, well, you know, that's just not overly aggressive, thing, you know, encode yeah. things because somebody might not be able to decode that. That's not what I'm concerned about. What I'm concerned about is people will just say, this gives me prettier output, therefore it's the one I'm going to use. Oh, I see what you're saying. But they'll, people will be focused very myopically on it's pretty rather than, hey, we actually are trying to protect you against things that you probably haven't taken into account. Right. So, I mean, frankly, if the only consumer of this is, I mean, to, to reduce this even further, yeah. if the only consumer that we need for this for 3.0 is the CLI, um, it's, it's not, by the way, but go on, because of a, because of a bug in XUnit, mm -hmm. then they can work around the bug in XUnit and not us rewrite the file in a different format. So ASP.NET would also use this uh, when writing responses, but, but, that's because ASP.NET controls the entire stack of the response all the way up and down and can properly audit that stack and say, we do not need the extra protections that the default behavior gives us. And then we do it for what reason, perf? Uh, for, for perf and readability. Well, mainly readability, not perf. But why would, but what I understand is like, why would they say, oh, we know that we can encode plus as plus, not as backstage you or something? Because they do things like set the content type char set header in the response. So a lot of the attacks that can be levied against this just disappear. I see. Yeah, that API name does not sound as bad. <laughs> but I also don't know what we would call it. Default with insecure escaping. Yes. I mean, I, it seems a bit... So, bad, yeah. I mean, you know... 3.0 was feature complete 30 days ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 3.0 is uh, super duper feature complete in um, like An 77 hour, 17 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, for, for 3.0, my answer, I would say we don't need this. Uh, and that they, they can get a fixed version of XUnit that fixes the bug. Like, yeah, I was about to say, like, what, what, what prevents us from just push fixing back a bit. We have already. I'm going to push back a bit, Jeremy. I don't think we should discuss the timeline here, particularly because I don't want this to go to ship room and come back later anyway. Because, I mean, you're, you're being optimistic that we can ship without, without this feature. <laughs> yeah, so my, my, but my point is, like, there are questions that we're asking. If, if we're saying for 3.0, then there's either no or what's on the screen right now, probably. But we've had other questions of future and combinatorics and what name should we give to this. And there are a lot of questions. And I think the answer is we should say hard and firm, no, this is not a 3.0 API. And API needs work. And so, kick it back to Levi for coming back in a month. So, so <laughs> I'll, can you, I'll come back in November, just like I did last November. Can you explain what you mean by when it comes back from Shiproom? Like, what, are you saying Shiproom might force us to ship an API? That seems backwards. No, so what I'm, what I'm saying is currently .NET test is broken. Mm -hmm. And we need a solution for that. And also, ASP.NET has been asking for this type of uh, feature for months now. So I think we should ship it, and it is required. For us to say, look, it's almost time to close on 3.0, doesn't necessarily, like, some, our, our party teams will come back and say we need it. But we need some solution. That's the same. I, I disagree. Right? So, so let, 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 let's, let's consider, uh, let's consider uh, CLI right now. So we can, as, as Steve alluded to, um, we can actually get a workaround for CLI. Like, they can, they can put the hack into their code. It's fine. Um, we would want a huge comment on the actual method itself, saying, like, this is not recommended practice. So what would they do? Like, with all the API, what can they even do? They would override JavaScript encoder, and they would, I'm sorry, they would subclass it. They would override one very particular method that says we allow plus to go through unescaped. 
Do we, do we have that API? Yes, there? that API is already there today. So what is because it? Because Steve, not, Steve actually API, created right? a workaround. So what is that API, it, by the way? Uh, Will it's subclass in JavaScript encoder, correct? Sorry? It's subclass in JavaScript encoder, correct? Yeah, and then you would, there's an API on it, which is Will encode. It's an abstract method. Um, you would override it, and you are passed in plus, and then you just return false. And if anything other than plus was returned, then you call into the bitmap directly. I see. Well, I looked just well, at JavaScript and code. I didn't see any merge. So not I base, forgot there's a base to but, yeah. but that seems like a very reasonable workaround. It's the, the problem with that workaround <laughs> is you can't call base. You have to delegate to someone else, which means you have to wrap the default encoder. I, I can't call base. Uh, because it's abstract. And there's and no derived JavaScript encoder. The ref should say that there's an override here, so you can call base to get to there. Yeah. The logic, the the will encode method, because it's abstract. When you call base, what is there to call? Uh, if you derive JavaScript encoder, JavaScript encoder overrode will encode. It will call the will encode on JavaScript encoder as long as the ref says there's an override there. Did it actually override will encode? It has to. It's abstract. No, it doesn't. When the, all of the factories create internal types. Oh, I see. This is on. I was looking in the file. I yeah. see it in JavaScript encoder, but it's yeah. on the class default JavaScript yeah. encoder. But the, the the thing is, because because the method's abstract, okay. you can't call base dot. You have to delegate to someone else. Whatever. Which now means that hopefully you've overridden every single method, and you're delegating to someone else. If we introduce a new virtual method in the future, such as operation status encode of read-only span of char then you now have potential security bugs inside of your encoder because you've overridden some methods and not others, which means you're delegating to some methods and well, not others. Okay, seems like that means that the better fix is JavaScript encoder should over... I mean, like, this means we don't have a good type hierarchy. We, that we oh, no, no. Fuck this this class model. This, <laughs> I, I, can, I can go on for hours about how the type hierarchy is incorrect. And in fact, I did do that for hours back in November and December, where all of these APIs kept getting punted back as, like, needs more info. But no, so, like, yeah, so my, if we, if we didn't have a timeline right now, I would say the answer for this is needs more work. Uh, that, that Levi brought in the name that he's not happy with because it doesn't convey the security concerns that he has with it. None of us can come up with a better name for it. Uh, we don't know if it should be an overload to create. We don't know if it should be just this accelerator. There's a bunch of stuff we don't know, which means the status on this is API needs work. Now, if we review this from the context of we have a 3.0 release that's coming out 30 days ago, uh, then is there something that we need to do right now? And I think that the answer for that is also no. Uh, sure, it would but be I, nice I, to have for ASP.NET. It would be nice to have for CLI. ASP.NET can take the higher bytes over the wire now. I, CLI can I, would, fix the I, I, I would put back, Jeremy, it's not nice to have. I mean, this is a customer, okay, customer and partner company. So yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm asking. Go ahead. It, it's not nice to have. It's necessary. It's blocking us in a uh, real scenario. No, it isn't. And also, I, 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 I'm also put back on the bug on the thing. a third party component. But yeah, sure. But also, you cannot force everyone to upgrade X unit. That's not the problem, right? So the, there is no reasonable workaround yeah. other than having to sub, uh, drive from JavaScript encoder. And also, if you drive from JavaScript encoder, you're forcing dependency model to use unsafe code because the, the API of JavaScript encoder, when you yeah. drive from it, it, has pointer methods. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah. And I would also push. By the way, I, I also push back on the concern of the naming because I don't think this is a very common request from people. I don't think the security concern. Like the name should should be so scary that people uh, run away from it. I think the documentation and guidelines can solve this problem fine no, as well. No, that, that one I disagree with. So, like for example, like what Levi brought up, I think is very valid, right? Like you you write a web API, right? You you test the thing in Postman or whatever your favorite REST invocation tool is. You look at your payload results. You look at the JavaScript. You're like, oh, this looks ugly. Then you go Google, why is my JavaScript result ugly? Then you find some stack overflow post where somebody says use relax JSON escaping and then it looks pretty. You're like, great, I will do that in all my applications now. And suddenly you people don't actually read the remark section in the docs that says, by the way, if you do that, you might be more insecure than you're aware. And that, that is something that you have to convey in a three-line code symbol that somebody can put on stack overflow. Like that is just a reality if we care about this as an attack vector, which we clearly do because we shipped a bunch of types that protect for this kind of thing, right? 
And then people are going to look at it, the summary, which is the only thing shown in IntelliSense, yeah. and they're not going to read it if it's more than like three or more than one line on the screen. So, yeah. so it obviously starts with dangerously. And so we can we can <laughs> if if we care about if all we care about is uh, is fulfilling SDL requirements and other first party code, like we can always fix that because we can always have a tool that runs over this and says, hey, make sure you audit this. What I care about is making sure the ecosystem itself is in it. Yeah, the, but that's the thing, right? I mean, yeah. I, I think if we talk about an Azure service that we have to lock down, sure, they will do the right thing, right? Yeah. If, if, we lo if we talk about how many people push file new project with customizations to Azure and host that shit, well, the, none of them will run SDL over their code base, no, of right? Not. And so like for them, it's more like, what's what are the defaults and, uh, um, you know, is is the result reasonable? I mean, another way of doing it is just use the different naming convention we always had, which is unsafe something. Or you could call it unsafe JSON escaping. I mean, we already use the unsafe convention all over the place to convey like this is a this is an API where you want to read the dogs. And if I see Stack Overflow post where somebody says, "Oh yeah, turn unsafe JSON escaping on," at least that should give you a pause. If that doesn't give you a pause, then well. <laughs> There's not much more we can do for you. But I would also agree with Jeremy, like in practice, I think a better design would have been if the CLI could just extend Java scripting code override this one method and be done with it, because that seems like what the what the API should be allowing us to do, right? The the API does allow that to a certain extent because without overriding anything, you can pass in the bitmap of characters to encode or not encode. The thing is, remember how I said the encoder's opinionated? <laughs> it will override certain entries in that bitmap, and plus is one of them. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. Like maybe we need. But that's not overriding the type. That's using the create. Yeah. yeah. yeah because the the thing that actually does the encoding, the thing that should have been JavaScript encoders, called yeah. internal sealed class default JavaScript encoder, yes. and uh, <laughs> that probably a better thing to do for this type then instead of add this is in the next we fix this library so i attempted like i i am going to be very salty here for a minute <laughs> because i haven't been salty for the past 53 minutes like i attempted to do this in october with this api review i attempted to do, the, to do this in november i attempted to do this in december the api kept getting punted like the feedback that I got from trying to do that was unactionable, and here's where we are. Are you trying to say is that the people that complain right now are not helping you? It's I need, I I need not just we don't like this. I need here's what can be done, and that I haven't heard. So to to be perfectly fair, like this, I mean, I, I remember the conversations. I just never had enough context to actually give you actionable feedback. Yeah, I think. Like if you want to fix this type, I mean, one of the things is is basically. I think one of the things we convinced ourselves in October or whatever December time frame it was that most people never ever create these guys. It's basically just infrastructure code in our end that has to do that. Yeah. Which is why I think the priority never bubbled up, right? Uh, this is an example where, well, yeah, if everything works fine, then that's true, but if there are bugs or whatever, then third parties have to extend those types, and that's where the thing falls apart because the sensibility wasn't really a, the thing we designed the type hierarchy for, it seems. Yeah. And, and if we want to fix that, then yeah, we probably should sit down and say, okay, here are the here are the extension scenarios we would like people to do. Like, for example, tweak the behavior of particular characters to be escaped, and then the question is, how many gestures do you have to do to pull that off? And today, the answer would be, well, you extend JavaScript encoder, you wrap a JavaScript encoder, you delegate to it's, it, you override all the virtuals, and then if, if all you care seems, about is plus, like it's far easier instead of subclassing this type to do a string replace. Far easier. <laughs> see, see, this is this is where like I, I believe I, I understand the, the security concern. I understand the security concern with uh, not making it e easy to relax it. However, this is we're just getting in the way of users who want to do this, right? If a user like we have sure. made the default secure, right? We made the default secure. Yeah, but yes. but Aston, that's not, not that's not an argument. Like I mean, if if you go to Razor, for example. Or let's say any sort of templating engine that 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 spits out HTML, right? People do want to string concatenate their SQL. They want to string concatenate the HTML. They want to image JavaScript right in there in the HTML. That doesn't make any of that secure. And like if you go down that path, you have fundamental holes in your in your application. 
that just yeah. we can't help you to fix. So, like, Amusing, they, amusingly it, enough, things like Razor will escape plus by default, like right. HTML escape plus, and people haven't stopped using Razor. Clearly, clearly not. Yes. This is this is also where I would say, like, yeah, if you look at your payload on the wire, like, sure, it would be nice if it would be readable, but for the most part, you also optimize for perhaps you're minifying it, so I'm not sure that it's that readable to begin with in most of the scenarios, right? Well, keep in mind that if you use relaxed JSON, the payload will be smaller. So there's a perfect implication by by not using it. It's not just about human readability, it's also about the payload right. being smaller. And we can trade you know, speed versus performance by using C instead of C sharp. But, um, <laughs> sorry, performance versus security. Uh, the uh, speed versus performance. Jeremy, I'm not, I'm not making this statement in isolation. Right. Your statement is in isolation. I'm talking about in, in context to user scenarios. Right. We have two partner teams who so are using it, who I want agree, to use it. I agree that there is a need. Uh, I, but I think that the API is not ready. I think we shouldn't rush the API just to meet the need, and the partners can work around it themselves. But, okay, but let's let's go back to one thing. All right, so, so one thing I do buy from Austin is like let's not block the reasonable because we don't have the perfect. So for example, if we were to rename this to something ugly, we'll be okay with that. I mean, the scenario is unblocked. The API doesn't look attractive. Is that good enough? Like, could we call it unsafe JSON escaping? I, I, I mean. That seems to me like it satisfies the security concerns because we clearly say in the API this is unsafe. It, it's easy to audit and uh, it will unblock the scenario. Now, it's not a generic fix, but the generic fix, I think, the, so the other thing is based on the, on, the, on the December and October discussions, I don't think we, we even know whether we can fix the hierarchy, right? So there's a lot of complexity to do that in a compatible way. And the answer might be we can't easily fix the hierarchy, but also modulo those workarounds yeah. It's also not a primary scenario we care optimizing for, which is why we kept punting the bug. So it's possible that we will never do the right thing, in which case maybe the compromise is the thing we will ever do, in which case if it just needs an ugly name, it needs an ugly name, and that, that one we can I'm totally fine. do right now. I'm fine with replacing relaxed with unsafe or unsafe relaxed or whatever. You know, we do have a guideline that says uh, optimize for clarity instead of brevity. So. <laughs> Safe relaxed. <laughs> yep. And now, since it's more than uh, four characters, nobody wants to use it. They'll just use default. <laughs> <happy. So. laughs> Lawson, would this address your concern? Uh, absolutely, my, Yes, absolutely. My concern would be addressed. <laughs> well, if, if, if. Regardless of the word unsafe, yes. we should probably have relaxed in there somewhere because that's what it's actually yeah. doing. Yeah. Is that an actual term that is known? No. Well, I mean, it's it, it's lax, uh, and we tell it again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm going to stay like steer far away from the whole unsafe conversation here. I mean, you, like, you're the one who brought up that you wanted the name to indicate to people that this is not a thing that you want to use without thinking about it. And we have two words in, in .NET that mean that. One is unsafe, the other is dangerous. Yeah. Uh, unsafe. I think you have slightly more verbiage now on unsafe than we have on dangerous. I think dangerous, we only had a few cases that we used it. Uh, yes, dangerous, or safe handle uses dangerous, but where dreadful uses unsafe, it means this will be faster, but may introduce a bug if you don't understand what it means. Yeah. Uh, and here, unsafe means uh, you have pointed the. This is a foot gun. Uh, be aware <laughs> it's loaded. Yeah. Which I guess is what all our unsafe mean. This is a foot gun. Yeah, I mean, I'm not entirely a fan of the unsafe convention either, but like it's the one we have, and we have so far failed to doing anything else. So, uh, I mean, it's a little better than do not call. Relax, Jason. So. Yeah. You can also prefix with, with is the application targeting network live. I mean, that also works. We have done this in a few places, apparently. <laughs> all right. So then I'm going to copy and paste this guy in. And uh, we all uh, swallow our pride and take a shower after this meeting. And then uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's it. <laughs> what can I say? I mean, like, this is. So the, what happens when you yeah. make a decision with 58 minutes to go in a release? Yeah. So. Oh, this clearly isn't going to be in 58 minutes. <laughs> like, clearly. All right.
Um, actually, let me not paste this in because the, the whole thing is referred to many times in this whole thing. Let me just add a comment that made it easier. After some discussion. We so so it's, it's somewhat unfortunate that the callers of this API are not in this meeting. I would expect some pushback on the unsafe because ASP.NET will now call an API that has unsafe in the name. Have you looked at the actual source code? <laughs> 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 All right, okay, that's fair. That's fair. All right, I, I'll retract my statement. And hope no, I mean, I give you that, that they will have opinions on that, but I think that's uh, this, I mean, I, I don't want to subvert your argument, but I mean that, that's kind of Jeremy's point. Is that like if we if we don't have enough time to discuss it properly, then maybe the correct answer is not doing anything. Yeah. So in, in, an interesting point to that, and th this is something that I myself have grappled with too. Like the word unsafe doesn't necessarily mean you are shooting yourself in the foot. Um, it just means there is a very high potential to make sure that you're handling the gun correctly. Yeah. It, it is a foot gun. Yeah. Press F one. Read what it has to say about itself. Yeah. Uh, don't, yeah. Don't just call this and think that it's fine. Like, know what you're doing before you do it. Right. Like, the, the unsafe class, for instance, is actually a really good example of this. Because the, the APIs on there, like, there, there are legitimate reasons to call those APIs. And we don't want to discourage people from calling them if they find themselves having those scenarios. But we want to discourage, I, I don't know, we, we want to discourage uh, arbitrary use of it. Like we, we want to make sure that if you are using it, you have thought long and hard about your scenario and that you've taken the appropriate steps That's to fair. make it correct. That's fair. And essentially the unsafe keyword in C sharp means I promise I know what I'm doing. Like that's that's all it means is the compiler lets you write code because you said you knew what you were doing. Yeah. Blithely. That's the word I'm looking for. We don't want people to use it blithely. That's fair. Cool. Yeah. So again with ASP.net, it would you know, the comments on this hopefully would say something like if you are in a content described payload such as charset UTF-8, then this is fine. Uh, and they'd be like, oh, we just we did this after we picked the charset equal UTF-8 header. So it's fine. Yeah, and, and you're not inside of another envelope like HTML or script. Yeah. And you're not putting this into a database that has a bar chart column. Right. And a few other things. Yeah. So. So you'll get to write those docs. Oh, I get to write them. Yeah. Okay. You're the That's one right. who can explain to people when they when they could possibly use this. And if again, my my opinion would be if we can't explain when you should use this, then we shouldn't have it yet. Okay. I'm just trying to push back on Rush. If we think that if we think that we can meet the needs and that this name is okay and that we can write the documentation for it in this release and be comfortable with the documentation, then sure. it is what it is. Like to to be fair, I think we didn't even discover the uh, the X unit bug until like a week ago. Yeah, but I I like this a lot better than the you know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. Let me actually show you what I just wrote up, so you can tell me whether you agree or disagree with my summary. What is the, the rationale between property versus factory method? I mean, a property is a factory method, right? It's just a factory method that returns well, the same instance every time. This is a singleton. Yeah. It's going to give you the same one every time. It's convenience. Factory method would allocate everything. Oh, because the create ones all take an argument. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because the, the default property actually just falls into the create method and then caches the result. This would do something very similar. By exposing it to a static property, we're saying that. Specific object returned from this one. Yeah, we say it's thread safe. We otherwise don't say the type is thread safe. Uh, actually, I believe that's documented. That the type that the type is thread safe. Oh, okay. Because the type itself, once it's created, is immutable. And I think we actually have documented on the text encoder base class all derived classes should be thread safe for multiple colors. 
I've been saying it, it's another difference between a creep yeah, method yeah, and yeah. a no, you're static right. like uh, singleton is. If you return to static, it better be threat static. Right? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that goes the, the intent is that these types are threat safe yeah. because they're, they're, they have a constructor and then they're completely immutable once they've been instantiated. So lazy is threat safe true? <laughs> uh, it's not lazy. Actually, Steve, Steve uh, actually made a fairly nifty perf optimization to the class um, that uses a little bit of laziness under the covers, but it's still threat safe. Right. One person in the chat, then you, uh, Kirk, it says, uh, ultimately, foot gun Jason escaping is the clear winner here. Hmm. <laughs> All right, so then. But we'd be relaxed, and then it would need to be foot gun relaxed Jason escaping. And uh, unsafe is a shorter version of foot gun. So, Mary Webster suggests that we use dodgy or perilous. <laughs> dodgy. I like dodgy. Dodgy, 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 dodgy is... escaping to me sounds like it only works half the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, half the time you might have a security hole, and half the time you might not. Fair enough. <laughs> half the time it works for you, and half the time it works against you. It's just a little dodgy. <laughs> I actually, I, dodgy would be great as a prefix for APIs. I would totally add it. We need a dodgy attribute, that's what we need. Yeah, well, and then, and then when someone files a bug, we're like, look, we said it was dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? Uh, I know what, uh, what issue I'm opening under an alternate account on April 1st. <laughs> All right, so then we are, as far as I can tell, done with the 3 old stuff. Thank you, everyone. Uh, what do you mean? We, this is the backlog now. Yeah, yeah. Another hour to go, right? I, I, I do appreciate that. You know, people took an hour out to review those. Oh yeah, we can totally bike shit for more than an hour if, uh, if you really, really want us. Yeah, and I, I can say no, like nobody's business. All right. So then, uh, any preferences for order here? Looks okay, like there's some, something that you, you could. Take yeah, I was gonna say, are there any that we won't understand that you just want to? Talk assertively for Tanner, and then I tried that last week and it got shut down. <laughs> so that that one that you're hovering over actually should be relatively yeah. straightforward. Yeah, this just woke them in. Yeah, I, I think the ones that uh, I've been asked and pinged the most about from the community are the ones we've said need dedicated sessions, like the yeah. uh, we want to support more types for a vector two, three, four, um, and things like that. No. Uh, and so we're not doing those today. Should we no. have members from like ML here when we discuss those? Or are they the ones kind of? No, this is us? community members, community, not okay. not Got internal it. requests. Yeah. Okay. So what is this one here? Can you talk to this because it's, it this seems straightforward, or is it not? This one Mark, you're ready for review? Yeah, I guess it was. Hold on, <laughs> I'm not prepared. Go to another one first. Okay, then we go to the last one. Um. So this is, I have an array, and I want to get a reference to where the first element of the array, or to where the element at index zero of the array would be. Basically, it's, it's very similar to saying ref my array sub zero, but it won't throw if the array happens to be zero length. Didn't we have an API for that? I feel like there was an unsafe API that did exactly that. What you can do right now is you can take the array, turn it into a span, and then call, uh, and then call memory marshal dot get pinnable reference from span or dangerous get pinnable whatever the API is. Um, this just collapses all of those together. So why does this give you a reference to the non-existent memory? Because it is where this is where the first element in the array would have been uh, had the array been non-zero length. And the reason that this is interesting is because if you're if you're trying to make very high performance methods, uh, you're going to be doing things like reference address comparison. Mm -hmm. So whenever you reach the end of the array, you need an address to compare your current pointer to. And this is that address if it happens to be a zero length array. Okay. So the way that you would do this is like ref of t start equals get raw array data my array, ref of t end equals unsafe dot add ref start comma array dot length, and then inside the loop iterate. So what is what's, well, how do we call our unsafe helper class? Is it just called unsafe? No. Where is it? It's called unsafe for memory marshal. Yeah. 
depending on which half of the universe you're looking at. Yeah, um, so there was some back and forth on this, on where the actual method belongs on, say, memory marshal or marshal. Um, and if I recall correctly, it may have been Jan, I think, who suggested memory marshal as a hobby. I don't have it up on my screen right now, so I can't. So why wouldn't we call it asref? Asref. Uh, there's already an asref API. On yeah. Safe. Yeah, but why would you just have one that is an overload that takes a array? Because asref, I believe, takes an object as a parameter. No, it takes span and we don't only span. Asref. Yep. So it seems like that's what you're doing, right? I might be misunderstanding. Zach. There's no asref API. Memory marshal dot asref. Oh, memory. I'm looking at unsafe. Derp. And you want this API specifically to not throw, but actually give you the address of the object plus whatever the offset is to get to the actual data, right? Well, asref is also uh, contingent on t or struct. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, asref. Asref takes a byte span, oh, basically raw, a raw memory sorry. buffer, and projects it as a struct. This gives you a ref to the actual element in the array. It doesn't yeah, do yeah, projection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, I missed that. How do you say it's a multi projection instead of an argument? For. No. Sorry, you want the overload to get reference? Yes, basically. So why yeah. can't you just call get reference? Because it takes a span of th to be able to pass in an array. Because git reference, uh, does it blow I, up? In what, zoom no, it doesn't blow up. Value, which for the empty array is where element where elements are would have been. Sounds like what you said earlier. Yeah, that's why I, I'm trying to understand what how this API because I I'm pretty sure we had an API like that. You know, just his opinions would put it. Yeah, I I would be fine with get reference. Yeah, basically this is what the guy is doing here too. It's like how is this any different from what that? I mean, you should be able yeah. to literally just call memory where Marshall yeah. Docket. Yeah, I mean that's basically what it does under the covers. Well, it 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 could. What else does it do? Well, it, the only thing is that. Uh, Memory marshal dot get reference of span and read only span is guaranteed never to fail. The method will never throw an exception under any circumstance. Uh, memory marshal get reference of tra could null ref, whatever. It doesn't seem like the worst thing in the world. Argument null. Uh, no null ref. Yon actually talked about that. Oh, because he would uh, actually it would be it would be a breaking change. That's what that's what it would be. It would be a source breaking change. So right now today. Uh, because T array is implicitly convertible to span of T, if you call get reference of T array, right now the method's guaranteed never to fail, even if you pass a null. With this overload, that would now be the better match, and you would get a uh, you would get a null ref coming out of it. Well, I mean, he's basically saying don't do that, right? No, so he he's saying don't do the null check at the beginning of the method. Just let the null ref propagate out. Yeah, no, I get that. So basically, so let's say we we remove this line here. Yeah. Right? If the thing only does this, then why do you need this API at all? Why can't you just literally call this API? This API will this API will is contracted to give you the address of where the first element in the array would be. If the array is null, the API is meaningless, and we have to throw an exception of some type, a null reference, argument null, whatever, because we literally can't give you the address of where the first data would be. Anyway, I'm still missing OK, but I think Emo's question is, if it's implemented as remove the if and just call the return yeah. forward, 
that will not throw because new span of null array is defined, that's yes. the default span, Correct. which means it would give you the ref to zero, the Correct. same as it's doing currently. So obviously, obviously the implementation does not look like this if a null reference exception is coming from somewhere. So where is the null reference exception coming from? The, the null reference exception would come from the, uh, the dereference of the length property. Where? It, it, it's, the method wouldn't look like what's written here because this method has a null check on the input parameter. And if we're removing that null check, we have to do it implicitly through accessing the length property. I, th I thought, so maybe I'm still not entirely sure. So why would a call, like why, why would we add this API at all? Why can't the call literally just say memory marshal dot get reference and passing in the array? Because any array is implicitly convertible to a span. Yes. Unfortunately, including the null array. Including yes. the null array, which would give you just an array, right? The implicit no, it, it, would, it would return back a ref of null, yeah, which, which is totally valid. If you read it, or write to it, you get which, which is fine, which is totally fine, because you, you're, you're still able, you're, the CLR guarantees, absolutely guarantees, that you can talk about the reference to the first element in the array, even if the array is of length zero. You just can't ever dereference it, but you can talk about the reference. In this particular case, if we said, here's an array that happens to be null, and you give me back the ref null saying here's where the first element of the array would be, you're now talking about a nonsensical address. Like you're, you've now basically violated the contract of the method. But memory marshal get reference already returns null ref. And it does implicitly... for null, it does only for null spans and null read-only spans. And when I say null, I mean they literally have a pointer to null inside of them. If you create a span or a read-only span around an empty array, like there actually is a memory address there. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think what Emma was saying is that we could just tell people to use memory marshal get reference. And that will create a ref a null ref if you pass in a null array. If you pass in an empty array, it will give you the address of the where the first element would be. Yes. So exactly what you're wanting for get a raw array data. And then you don't need the if array equals null check because you'll just allow the implicit null to happen. Yeah. Yes. So, if, so is there is there any better justification inside of this work item than what I'm saying? <laughs> like in anywhere in the comments, is there better justification for, for why we needed it? I fundamentally to me it sounds like it's literally yeah exactly. So this is yeah basically what this guy is saying. No, it, it sounds like what's being argued on both sides here is why do we even need the method at all? Yeah. Right, because you can just yeah. use git reference. And what I'm trying to figure out is if there's better justification inside here. Something anyone at all typed. Yeah, I think the only benefit would be if you called it git reference and took the T array, you avoid the need for any kind of conversion to span yeah. in the case where you already have an array. But other than that, I think you can achieve exactly this using the existing git reference. I mean, with no me, overhead. It sounds more like the only thing you can't do is you can't say git reference open paren now close paren because that, that wouldn't convert. But right, like, but I mean, I mean, it, it would seems very, very yeah. yeah. Null as t array would work. Yeah. Or default would work. I mean, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, can't say no. Pick some sort of t, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, to me, I, 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 we can just mark it as like, okay. can somebody explain to us why we would need yeah, the API? Yeah, so pun, punt it back then. Um, Let me actually just try to write yeah. it first. Uh, maybe well, not. I thought that would be easier, as with all things. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm up to date with the, with the issue that I said. I Great. was like, no comment. I'm glad I bought you time. <laughs> I've got another one that would be good, the unsafe skip in it, that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So one, I guess one difference between this and new span of t is that new span of t uh, does array variant checks on its input, whereas this wouldn't. Oh, I think I know what the problem is. So if you have an object array, 
that's really a string array, this method would still work. Also, what happens when you have span of t and with only span of t as overloads when you pass in a t array? Aren't they both convertible? I thought C sharp said that span was preferred. one of them was preferred. I, I, Let's try I think that array is only convertible to span of t, but that span is convertible to read only span. So since span you get there in one hop. No, no C sharp never does double implicit conversion. Okay. No, the way C-sharp works is it compares the conversions from span to read only span of t, and since read only span of t has a convert, sorry, since span of t has a conversion to read only span of t, read only span of t would be considered proof. No, span of t will be preferred because it's more specific. Right, but I was saying that if you've got it, yeah. I, what I was saying is if. If span has an implicit conversion from T array, uh, and read only span didn't, C sharp won't allow implicit conversion of T array yes, to read only span that's right. because it doesn't do double hopping. Both of them have an implicit conversion. It only does it for primitive types in certain circumstances, which is super weird. Apparently, span and read only span aren't allowed by try dot mount, so I can't test it right now. Which I guess makes sense. Um, Pretty sure span will be allowed, but uh, again, things like um. What do you mean it's not allowed? Uh, System dot span cannot be found. Uh, you need to change off two nine to not two nine, like x sixty four. How do I do that in try dot not? Um, the little drop down where. Oh no! D don't do try dot net. Go to sharp lab. <laughs> try dot net is uh. Not as sophisticated for the purposes of ILD compiling. Sure. Okay, so it picks the span overload. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Which means if you have, again, if you have a local typed as object array and it's pointing to a string array, which is totally possible because of array variants. Uh, you'll actually get an exception at runtime. Because you can't create a new span of object around a string array, for instance. I don't know if that's an important scenario, but it is an example of what would fail. All right, so I put it back, and then you can think about this offline, and then sure. probably Jan can do it in five seconds, but... I think of a scenario for it. <laughs> None of us are Jan, so... What was the uh, item number on that? Uh, it is... Um, three, six, one, two, three. All right, thank you. Um, all right, Tanner, what's, what's yours again? Uh, it was... Uh, oh, yeah, we have it here. Yeah. All right. Okay, so basically, um, in normal mathematics, a cross product only applies to a three dimensional vector. Uh, but it's very common to have overloads that also do a cross product on two and four dimensional vectors because it's basically just a simplification of the algorithm. Um, and so the request is that we expose those um, on system numerics vector two and four. Okay, that seems like a. Close to zero right now, right? It's just, I mean, is is that does this cross product formula have an industry accepted definition? Because it's the three dimensional. It, so the cross product applies to three, seven, and other dimensions. And um, when those uh, for those dimensions, the algorithm is all well defined. And so the simplification is basically saying, because the unused elements are zero, you can drop those because the subtraction of um, the subtraction of zero returns the original result. So this is basically just saying, given the three-dimensional cross product, drop the third dimension because uh, zero, z times anything will be zero, and so the subtraction will be zero, so you can just drop it. 
But I think right. to Jeremy's question, is that how people interpret the cross That's right. how DirectX math exposes it and okay. some other well-known libraries. But yeah, that seems to be isn't, so like on the vector two, oh, I guess the, is, so this is, if you assume the z is zero, then a cross b produces uh, a thing that is perfectly aligned with the z axis, and that's why you're getting a point. Like, I don't understand how the cross is producing a single value of a point. Well, that's just what cross product does. Cross product always produces a, a vector. No. Yes. Because A cross B is the right hand rule. A cross B is. Oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're uh, right. You're, dot products yeah. produce a single. Yeah. Or dot products produce a scalar. Cross products yeah. produce a vector. So I don't understand how vector cross vector is a float. Uh, <laughs> let me double check. <laughs> There's a comment on there that explains it. Uh, you scroll up a little bit. The value of the z coordinate from the cross product. That's yeah. What it says. Yeah, it only produces the z value since the since the vector two exists in an x y plane. So effectively, what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. That it, it's because it's because the x goes to zero and the y goes to zero. So, but I mean, it's only projecting out of plane. But I, like, I just wonder if. If we need a more complicated version of cross, but that's where I'm asking the question: Is is this a? Is it, if we went to MATLAB, would it understand this version of a of a vector two vector two turns into a scalar as a cross product? I don't know if MATLAB would, but for example, the DirectX math library, which is what the vector two three and four implementations were originally based off of, exposes these methods. Because they're commonly used in various um, graphics applications in gaming. Well, my my position is that that's what ends up happening. But it yeah. seems fine to me. Um, it is worth noting that the one difference is that. Um, DirectX math does still return a vector, but with the value permuted to all results, which is what we do for some other um, methods on vector two, three, and four as well. So DirectX would vector two cross vector two produces a vector two where x and y have the same value? Yes. So it's a question of do you want to return a vector and permute, or do you want the user to explicitly have to permute it to all results? So then what's 4 doing? It's returning the vector 4. Right, right. But, yeah. Uh, but I don't know I don't know how to right hand rule 5 dimensions, so I don't know what vector 4 is losing over vector 5. Uh, um, so like I don't know enough about multi-spatial geometry to understand. Like the question I'm really asking is are we are we modeling bad behavior or are we modeling standard behavior? We're modeling behavior that's commonly used in games. By anyone other than DirectX? Uh, well, I mean, no one else really exposes a math library. Unity has similar functions, I believe I looked. Like, does OpenGL have a similar thing? It, OpenGL does not have a math library. Okay. Not, not a standard one, at least. Yeah, it was... Um... Okay, no. Unity nor XNA uh, or FNA provide cross for vector 2 and 4. DirectX does. Um, and I thought there was another one that did, but I did not list it. I mean, it seems like most people just consider it not defined, so in that sense it's not conflicting. It just means we have a behavior mm -hmm. that somebody has, and if you don't want to use it, then don't use it, which seems reasonable. Okay. I just worry we are going to teach the children wrong. We probably are, but I we're mean, going that's... to get yelled at by geometry professors from yes. mm. ages to come. Don't <laughs> use float then. <laughs> uh, I've been trying to say that. You keep bringing it up. Well, yeah, so... <laughs> because people use float. Especially for the cases where this is intended for use. Um,
All right. And your vector two, if you cross yourself, yeah. do you end up with a non-zero answer? If you cross with yourself in two, no, you shouldn't because x and y are both zero. Well, because the definition of cross product says if you cross with yourself, you produce the zero vector. Right, so you should pr be producing zero as well. Yeah, I'm just, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if the math that we added there would say that that would be yeah. So in four dimensions, the Hodge dual of a bivector is two-dimensional, another oriented plane element. You said words confidently. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you at least be honest about what your criteria is. <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. I only heard the way you said it. I mean, it you said good the me. Hodge dual of the bivector <laughs> is a something. Um, yeah, it basically retor returns an oriented plane. <laughs> I gave up on eigenvalues in college, so whatever. Yeah, yeah, I mean, eigenvalues. I, don't yeah, so my only concern is if we're, like, we're using a word in a way that it doesn't hold in the industry, that that yeah. is not good. It's but. that it's it's the Wikipedia page has an entire section on like true cross products exist in three, seven, eleven, and <coughs> other dimensions that I can't remember <laughs> and can't comprehend. Um, because I stopped caring after like three. Yeah, when I, I I can only do this. Yeah. Past this, I don't know how to do a cross product. And then so, there's well, the time. there's well four. defined mathematics for others, but it doesn't. It's not like a true cross product as you would consider appropriately dimensioned ones. Okay. As long but as... it exists in higher kind of mathematics. Yeah. So I guess yeah, my my other way of phrasing that is if. If there are multiple interpretations of what a cross product could mean in mm. in, in uh, even space, and we're choosing one, then we should be conscious about choosing one instead of yeah. uh, simply deciding on a whim. Uh, and if there are two, then maybe we would need more complicated names of like right. cross whatever and cross whatever, so that we can have both implementations or all twenty seven yeah. or whatever. Th there should not be two. The algorithm is well defined for any dimension. Right. All right. But it seems like we are. There's a um, there's another one which is three eight five eight five, which might be simple. We just killed it. Oh, does it involve the I, whatever of the so three five? The what was that? The what? Uh, three eight five eight five. No, no. Yeah. Three eight five eight five. Three eight. You most clearly already have the issue. No. Five eight five. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do that. I don't know why, but I'm really bad at listening to numbers. Yeah. So Ooh, this one's adding. This one. a, yeah, adding a new method to unsafe. Basically, C sharp has definite assignment rules. You can bypass those in a lot of cases, but not all of them. Um, this is saying we should expose a new method called skip in it, which takes an out t and uh, literally does nothing as its implementation allowing you to bypass definite assignment for any value, whether it's this or anything else. Um, the primary use case for this would be things like when you have union types where uh, C Sharp requires you to initialize every field um, and the overhead of pinning might be too high. I am fundamentally opposed to this in combination with the fact that the CLR supports uh, non-initializing or not initializing local. This does not apply to the this parameter and to um, out variables that you know are definitely assigned, but the C sharp compiler has trouble um, analyzing appropriately. Yes, but in addition to stack alloc, which can give you previous stack that was not cleared, uh, if you have the zero or no zero in it or whatever the flag is set, uh, then you do this on a large struct and it's now populated itself with whatever was previously on the back. Right. Instead of zeroing itself out. So I, I, which is I why this really is fundamentally believe we should not add this ever. Which is why this would be on unsafe. Because you can do the same thing by pinning explicitly, but there's overhead from pinning, which may be unacceptable in some high perf scenario. What, do you mean you can do the same thing for pinning? If you take the address of a variable using unsafe, C sharp oh, avoids yes. all definite assignment rules, but pinning has some implicit overhead. 
uh, uh, that may be undesirable in some scenarios. And so this basically gives you an out for that, saying this is a zero cost way of saying, I know what I'm doing. I know I'm definitely signing this appropriately. Let me do so. So how would this API be used then? Uh, commonly, if you're in a constructor, uh, for example, of a union type with explicit field layout and everything else, the first thing you would do is you would say skip in it out this. And then you can freely assign only the union field that is the correct type for the current constructor and you would not initialize everything else. And so all memory would be appropriately initialized, but you would not incur the zero allocation cost of um, all the other uh, fields, and you wouldn't be forced to assign all other fields. And we are sure there's no call being made because the JIT inlines it as a normal. Right, the JIT would see it as a rat, so it would inline it to nothing. So there's literally no call added. There's no IR blocks added. Um, it's completely elided. Is there something we would be able to do um, that would kind of help alleviate some of your concerns? Like uh, get rid of the no zero init feature from the CLR. <laughs> <laughs> At which point I don't care anymore. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you Tanner, would, it be, would it be elided in tier zero? It wouldn't, right? Um, I think in tier zero, it would depend on whether or not the JIT recognized it as an intrinsic, as it does with many of the other unsafe methods. I, I would think it would be elided because we we would need to special case this method in the JIT anyway. So I don't see why it well, wouldn't be elided. You, you wouldn't necessarily have to special case it, in which case in tier zero, I think it would still be emitted as a call that does nothing. Um, oh, okay. But if you did special case it, then you could just have the JIT drop it from code gen entirely in the importer. Okay. Read JIT would see that it had no problem, yeah. but okay. first JIT wouldn't. I mean, depending on, if first JIT's already seen this a trillion times, then maybe it would already. Yeah, yeah, because the tier zero doesn't try to inline anything that isn't marked as um, aggressive optimization, okay. I don't think. Got it. Yeah, I mean, like you can, you do the same thing already by invoking into a thing that doesn't actually pay attention to the thing. So right. this is already possible. It's just yeah, it's possible. I really don't There's like just minimal um, overhead that do, this would avoid. Do we have code pads in Core CLR or Core FX right now that would be able to benefit from this? I'm not sure if we do in Core FX and Core CLR. I know there's places where we take advantage of the fact uh, that we strip locals in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know we've got measurable perf increase from that, but I don't think we have many union types today. Are they more common in things like uh, graphics code. processing, interop code? Inter interop code in general, because uh, a lot of C code uses unions, um, especially in the Windows layer. Would it make more sense, just devil's advocate here, if we could somehow make the JIT recognize that we're setting through, through setting very specific fields of a union struct, we're basically overwriting every single byte in it anyway, so it shouldn't bother. I, mean, I guess it's not the JIT, it's a C-sharp compiler that's complaining. Yeah, in this case, it's yeah. a C-sharp compiler that complains and forces you to do so. Yeah. And I think from my perspective, like, I, I would want to see this added only when we had, like, honest to gosh, cook that we had that would benefit from it. Like, I would want to see this checked in at the same time that we consumed it in places where measurements showed it was valuable. Well, I've got measurements that can show it's valuable in interop code I've written that's external to the framework, which is really what this is intended for, is like, not the framework itself, but interop code outside the framework. Um, I, I would buy that argument, actually. Right now I'm trying to do this with IL rewriting, which messes up PDBs and things like that. Um, and I'd rather have a built-in mechanism on the existing unsafe class we have for things like this to make that easier. So I, I wonder if maybe we should add to, if, if you're willing to share that code, mm -hmm. if we could add to this issue like the before and after for the kind of code that you have to write. Yeah, I, I guess the before and after is really just my struct t equals default or not. But if you right, could, yeah, if but, you could dump but the code I'd love to understand like what the what what you have to do to work around that today and what the actual throughput gains are. 
Yeah. No, but we, we could we could actually still do this because if if in order to make C sharp happy, if you write my struct t equals default and then t dot field one equals t dot field two equals blah blah blah, if we could somehow get the JIT itself to realize that every single overlapping field was actually being set appropriately, could the JIT just elide the equals default at the very beginning? I think the analysis for that is expensive. Okay. But I'm not positive on that. Because I, I was just thinking if we could somehow do that as, as an alternative to this, then even non-union structs should benefit from it. Right? Well, I think in the case of non-union structs, you're only assigning each field once. Yes. So it doesn't matter. It's in the case where you're being forced to assign the same memory multiple times because it's overlapping. Yeah. And the C-sharp compiler has no knowledge of like, hey, these fields are overlapping, but I'm only wanting to access these. Right, and that's where the equals default comes in at the beginning, right? Yeah, because well, that, that just clears out everything. Yeah, you right. either have to equals default, uh, which forces potentially triple zero initialization yeah. uh, in addition to the, the stack zeroing that the JIT does. Um, or you have to pin, which involves some overhead, and both of those in tight loops um, can be significant. Like, uh, if you're doing DirectX 12 inch ROP, you might have uh, render targets, which you might have like eight of. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that is built up of multiple union layers. Yeah. And so you're going to want to clear, clear some of those and set up logic and everything. And you're going to have to loop through that. And each time you loop through, you're going to have to clear out fields that you're not touching and yeah. then reinitialize them. Um, so what, what if... What if, um, as we said, like take take some of the code that you've written, yeah. put it in here just to show, but also if you can somehow dump the before and after code gen, I think yeah. that would probably really solve us. Yeah, I can do that. Does that seem reasonable, Steve? Yeah, I just want to, I'd like to see, you know, real code benefiting mm -hmm. it from before we add something that works against the language like this. Yeah. Because ideally, like ideally, I would really like to have the JIT just understand it. But if, as you say, it's impractically difficult, yeah. then this might be a decent alternative. Is it really working against the language, though, considering you can already do it? It just has minimal overhead from requiring you to pin? Yes. OK. Because I, I have no doubt you'll actually be able to show frames. Right. It's just I think visualizing those would help us, to right. be perfectly honest. Yeah, I've got an existing app, um, a demo app of DirectX interrupt code that runs on Xbox via UWP, and I can just, um, okay. I can, I think I actually pushed that to GitHub recently, so I can just, uh, do the IO rewriting and okay. show the difference. Along these same lines, like, did we ever actually make public the API which allows you to set skip locals in it? Uh, no, the method? C sharp language is uh, the the initial prototype was done by an intern and it's in a branch, but it requires further review and okay. um, clean up before it can be checked into master. Okay. And I think it's not as high priority right now because CoreFX and CoreCLR are using the uh, IL linker flag that we added instead. Got it. Which IL rewriting. Have you heard this comment? Yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. Um. These ones look reasonably simple. Let me start with this one here. Do you really not have this already? Well, it's a constructor. Oh, a constructor. Right? Why? <laughs> yeah, what's the difference between this and 
public string builder one. I think this is the entity. Oh, that's it why. It does the wrong thing. That's why. I think that's actually a fairly good point. <laughs> Theoretically, it could be a breaking change. So what we what we might want to do is um, <laughs> I mean, that if, someone, if someone was using the ASCII letter as the yeah. capacity. <laughs> If, if you wanted to do this, there's already a constructor on the string type itself that takes a char and a repetition count. There's not necessarily... Oh, there's also an overload of string builder.append that does the same thing. Append, char, int, repeat count. Having a constructor that just initializes that would, would provide symmetry. Yeah, to me, the argument is more people write code that looks reasonable but doesn't do what you think it does. Right, and then that could be a silent source breaking yeah. change. It could be. On the other hand, that seems far fetched. The only real value that would conflict that people are likely to pass in is the literal zero. And zero is always going to match to int before it patches to char. But that's inspect, uh, expected, right? If, yeah. you, if you have a literal zero there, I don't think you would think this is a character. Right. If you have a literal zero, you're probably uh, calling the capacity-based overload. Seems odd to do that, but yes. Well, you, I could reasonably expect that you could pass zero for initial capacity and like 2k for max capacity. Sure. I'm stretching a little bit, but I, I could see it partly reasonable. Yeah. That particular overload, by the way, int int, uh, is 9% usage across APIs of .NET. So what was it? So there's an int int overload on string builder, initial capacity, max capacity. That particular constructor has 9% usage across APIs of .NET. Oh, this is the capacity and max? Capacity and max, yeah. The overload that takes just capacity has fairly substantial usage, which kind of makes sense. Because people, when they're creating string builders, often have a good estimate of how large it should be. Yeah. Well, they're passing the video whether it's a good estimate or not. Yeah. I'm not sure they'd help with them on profiling that, but. Sure. <laughs> but anyway, long, long story short, if we wanted to do this, I would probably do char repeat count rather than just. Well, but that would defeat the purpose, right? Not really. Like you would, the uh, because the point is not that they want to do that. Right? Yeah. The point is that it doesn't do what they think it does. So we will always have to have an overload that just takes charge, so, so that this is calling that one, not okay, calling sure. the one that takes capacity. Right? Sure. But yeah, I don't. I per, yeah. I mean, to me, it would be very reasonable to say you just do the capacity, and then you say a pen char with the repeat count. If you really want to do that, but so this, this is where the way. Th this is where I make everyone sad by saying, you know, C plus plus has this awesome feature where uh, for individual methods you can oh. say I want to uh, forbid implicit conversions from data type A to data type B when this method's being invoked. I think you have a point though, because the same error applies to the other one as well. I don't know if anyone. Also, does this only happen with literals? Yes. That is my understanding. Does it call it repeat count? No, it compiles. So there is, and that's important. So there is an implicit conversion from char to int. 
So I think we should just add these two and call it a day. Yeah, I'm not opposed to that. Seems fairly straightforward. I mean, this would be a good one for the community to pick up too. Yeah, I think this one is a pretty simplistic one. There's a there's a flip side to this, which, which is, is someone we we add this API, someone now starts using this constructor copy paste the code into something that doesn't have the API and now they're going to get weird behavior. Yeah, but how many things do you know that would uh, similar to string where you pass in multi-targeting framework in core. So what? Multi-targeting framework in core. Yeah, oh, and we start using this yeah. API in in our source common folder, right? Mm -hmm. Or yeah. any similar situation. Or again the stack overflow copy paste as mentioned earlier. We're calling a different overload now. <laughs> Yeah, this, this honestly, like I understand the concern, but this doesn't seem. There are plenty of places where you, implicit casts can cause you to yeah. like an API doesn't exist. You call it thinking that it does, and you end up implicitly casting to something else. Like it doesn't. I get that it's a pain, but uh, I'm not sure it's worth it. it. It seems like we need an analyzer, analyzer. Yeah. in either scenario. Mm -hmm. Either to either we don't have these APIs, and we need one for both core and framework to say, hey, you're passing in a character here. We don't have an overload that accepts it. Or we add the API and the analyzer is only for framework. But I think we need an analyzer for this case. I don't, would people actually get the full framework analyzers? Like, how would they get those analyzers pulling in the package manually? It's, a, it's honestly a case, I think that's chicken and egg problem of like, how do you get people to use analyzers when they don't reference NuGet packages by default? And yeah. like just broadcasting the fact that they're there and blog post saying, this is why you should probably have it and trying to get people to have the best practice of including analyzers is probably yeah. the only fix. But this would be, things along these lines would be, uh, would be good. hard. Now this is just making me sad that we have a charter and implicit conversion. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, it's not something that's going to surprise you in a production application. You're going to find it immediately. That that yeah, I think I just edited this comment, but I, I honestly think like at this point, I think Stephen has two good points. One of them is us just adding the APIs may make it actually worse. And then the other problem is it, it, it's just how C Sharp works, right? Like if we add the APIs here, now we may have to add this in plenty of other places where we have similar patterns where it just becomes this uh, never ending thing, right? And as you said, like, yeah, you will find the new day. Like it's not like a life ending event. It's like you run the code once, doesn't do what you want, fix your code. Um, you assume customers test their code. Well, I mean, if they don't, then realistically, there's nothing we can do because there's like a million other things they can do wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, I would just say, you know what, let's just close it. It's a good point, but... So just resolve it then? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I get a little bit of anxiety when we talk about warts in the framework like this, but I I guess you and Steve and others have kind of accepted this as a fact of life better than I have. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, like, I mean, if this, I mean, it's it, it looks pretty bad on the surface, right? But how many times has anybody ever heard of this issue? I mean, I've never heard of it. You probably never heard of it. Like, so that kind of proves to me, like, while the problem looks bad, it can't be that bad in practice. Like compared to, let's say, braces, right? Where we know that if you don't have braces in the hip block, you can cause plenty of bugs. So it's, yeah. Yeah, we don't enforce having them in our coding guidelines. 
Uh, we do. Well, that's what we did. No, yeah. the guideline says that yeah. it is not required for single line, but you can't have some code pattern following it or something yeah. like that. We should. Uh, we should probably just turn on some type of style and filter. I know we already have it for the native side. We have three minutes left. Do you want to discuss style now? <laughs> it's like that. Uh, discuss what? Discuss coding style. Yeah. Um, all right. So. Uh, is the one in the middle of the screen short? The what? The move method is that one short? Yeah, that's what that I Three minutes. Uh, oh. So this is moving an array or a list in place. It's basically moving one range to the other, right? Or swapping two. Is it two elements or? Oh, okay. So move element and then move elements. Yeah. How does this work if? I don't think we can get to this in three. How does it work for the first overload if? from precedes two. Because the first overload basically oh no that's that's just swapping one, isn't it? It's not doing a count. Never mind. Because I, I originally thought that this was swap. Well the first one's the first one is a move, not a swap. And then the second one is also a move, not a swap. Um, but for a range. But I would maybe expect copy, not move. Well, it's not a copy. You, 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 you don't increase the number of elements in the array. You're copying a range from one location to the other, to another location in the same. Just like, so you already have, it. we already have copy overloads that take two arrays where you can give the same, and you can give source and destination index and things like that. Yeah, but move might imply zeroing. Yeah, but to, me, no, to me, it's like you have A, B, C, right? Mm. If I move these fuckers index zero, it's not a copy, right? You basically have B, C, A, right? Like no. B. That that would be a swap, not a move. No, it's a shift, right? Not a swap. Well, that's also not a move. Move would be you would have B, C, C would be move. Or potentially... No, that would be a copy. I mean, that's what I'm saying. To me, move implies there's a shift. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking to see what the actual proposal is. I'm having... That's why I'm saying I don't think it's copy. Because I think if, if this is a copy, I would agree with you. This would be B, C, C, right? Like, if you're thinking of it in terms of most move semantics, like files or other things like that, it in, it generally involves moving and then deleting the old index, so BC0, or leaving the original BCC. Yeah, but, but exactly what you just said, right? If you do what you just said, if you look at it from a file standpoint, yeah. if, 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 if I do this, I take this range, now I have BCABC, then you delete this one, well, then you end up exactly in what I just said. Yeah, the, the act, if you read between the lines on the proposal, they're, uh, they're proposing a shift inside. I don't think move is the best name for that. Yeah. yeah. So if you're, if you're moving later in the list, then everything between from and to gets shifted to the left by one. The original element gets inserted immediately after that shift, and then everything after that remains unchanged. Um, if you're moving an element before its current position in the list, everything in between gets shifted right by one, and then the original element gets placed right there. It's that code right there. Yeah. It. So it, it really is a glorified, wherever this element happens to be, remove it right now, and then insert it at the index I'm telling you to. Yeah, it's basically logically remove followed by an add. Yeah. Now by, or insert I should say, but like, how often do you need this? Do you need a method for that? It seems like a very far-fetched thing. Yeah. I mean, we can consider it next time too. Yeah, like, I would. It's think, interesting. I would think that the potential benefit would be if you do insert and remove, you might incur more copying than required, um, or more shifting. No worries. Right. 
Alright, so we have to be losing the room, let me just hang up now.